begin by asking how many of you are on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or whatever? Can I just have a quick show of hands? So, okay, that's it. Uh, to show both hands, you know, yeah. because we are running <laughs> Because there are so many accounts, right? Yeah. So, I just want to give you a, a few statistics. As far as I know, India has about 30 million Twitter users. Can I, can I just interrupt, you know, because it's not printed, what is the subject today? Trolls and how they affect public discourse. Trolls and public discourse. Trolls and public discourse. So before we go into the subject of trolls, That's I think we should know exactly what we are dealing with statistically. So there are about 30 million Twitter users in India. Uh, it may not sound like a lot, but it's growing at a rate that is five times the global average uh, in India. And we have about, I think, about 100 million Facebook users. So Twitter actually accounts only for 17 to 20% of Indian uh, uh, yeah, social media use. Having said that, uh, social media obviously, that doesn't sound like a lot in a country of 1.3 billion or so, but it obviously has an outsized uh, impact. Let me just quickly run through a couple of examples from just this past month on how uh, trolls work uh, and how the social media is evolving. The most recent example I think that got a lot of attention was uh, a, a tweet which was a collage of images of Nehru with various women. Did you see that? Yeah. So, and of course that went out saying that Hartik Patel has got uh, Nehru's DNA. Now Hartik Patel as you know, now Hartik Patel as you know, if, uh, for those of you who know, there was a video which came out of him with some woman, you know. Uh, I didn't actually see it. Did you see it? He was apparently making love to some woman. Nothing intrinsically wrong with that, but obviously the uh, guardians of morality found there was something wrong with that, tweeted it out. So this is what uh, this tweet said. In these photographs, of course, once you went into the photographs, you found the problems. For a couple of photographs, he was hugging his sister, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, who was then, I think, ambassador to Russia, and she had just returned. <laughs> Another photograph, he was uh, hugging uh, Nayantara Segal, who was Pandit's daughter and his niece. And in one photograph, he was just lighting a uh, um, um, no, he was applying a tilak to Jacqueline Kennedy. That was all it was. It doesn't matter. It just went viral and that, in a sense, already started setting the discourse. Now when we talk of trolls and public discourse, the problem was that this um, tweet was sent out by the head of uh, the BJP's uh, media infrastructure, the media cell. Uh, so the point, uh, uh, Ram, is that um, the question of trolls and public discourse that trolls are within now within the government itself. So how then does that affect public discourse? Well, uh, it legitimizes it. It takes it further. It gives open license if the head of the ruling party's IT cell uh, manipulates, twists, distorts the truth, and also often uses vulgar and abusive language. Uh, however, uh, and that's however, I think uh, the tight terms. As I said yesterday, there are no permanent winners and losers in history. And after three, three and a half years of uh, deliberately and systematically injecting poison and bile into public discourse, and particularly social media, you have uh, a remarkable Amit Shah telling his followers, don't trust social media. Because there's a pushback against it. Uh, many people are disgusted and revolted by this. Uh, you know, the most unlikely people suddenly get lots and lots of Twitter followers. Uh, I refer to the leader of the, 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 uh, the person who's about to become president of the Congress party. And uh, who may or may not write his own tweets. I think our home state has something to do with the quality of his tweets, by the way. But as I said, as I said, you know. So, uh, but you know, so I think the wheel could turn. But it is true that you said that, uh, somebody you said that uh, Twitter followers are going at five times the rate. India as elsewhere. So I it will be interesting to see whether social media discourse, particularly Twitter, uh, is as debased and vulgar in other countries. I mean Trump, obviously, I mean the competition, uh, I mean I'm sure Amit Malviya is taking some lessons from Trump. You know. uh, but otherwise whether it's so. But I think you know it's you uh, among the things, of course, that are disturbing are uh, the uh, anonymity. You know, you, 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 you speak under your name, I speak under my name. Most people tell me that is under his name. But most of the trolls speak under somebody else's name. And that gives them a cloak to abuse. And uh, also, I should say that, as you know very well, uh, social, 
the chronic is particularly vicious against independent minded people. So you and I get it bad, yeah. but women get it much worse. Well, no, no way close to what women get. There are uh, continuous threat, threats of rape, of killing their children, raping their children. I, I say all this because my wife is one of them who gets it and gets it all the time, uh, these kind of things. And prominent women are definitely, uh, you know, the most affected. But uh, in reference to what you said across the world, this is definitely, it's, this is not an Indian phenomenon. This is happening across the world. We know what has happened in America. Uh, we also know that trolls are now becoming weaponized. There is no question about that. There are troll, it's gone from trolls to troll armies that are being formed. In other countries, provide a foresight of what might actually uh, happen, a foretaste of what might happen to India. In Turkey, which I think is the most advanced, there are the AK trolls um, who belong to the AK party. They're called AK trolls. And they do all kinds of things, which is essentially anti-Israel, anti-America, anti-Gulen, etc. And uh, they have a, a technique. What they do is that uh, from fake handles, they create fake handles in the name of certain people and then tweet out provocative stuff, then complain to the authorities against the handles that they themselves have created and say, look at this. And Turkey being a country where the process of law is far more, is disintegrating at a quicker pace than here, then in many cases the government authorities have taken action against the real people in whose name the fake handles have been created. So in which case you're creating an alternate reality against people, public intellectuals who have nothing to do with it, have not said anything at all, but the action is taken against them anyway. Uh, Russia, we know what's happening in Russia. They have used it in Ukraine. They have used it in the U.S. presidential election, which is why there is so much uh, chaos now in the U.S. Uh, so the trolls are definitely getting weaponized. What would you think might happen in a country like India if trolls got weaponized? And they are, in a sense. They haven't yet got weaponized. They're getting organized, but I don't think they're there yet. You know, it's interesting because I am, unlike you, Samad, and unlike so many people in this room, uh, I'm technologically illiterate. I'm hopeless. Uh, I got a smartphone six months ago and that was because I only got it because my daughter had a week in which to teach me how to use the smartphone. Full week. Uh, I'm telling you all this because I was not on Twitter, I was not on Facebook. And I caught on when uh, somebody was running an account in my name and pretending to be me. Now I was in Colombo to give a lecture and this person said, the streets are very clean in Colombo, I wish streets in Bangalore would be so clean. No, I, 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 actually, that's true. The streets in Colombo are three times those in Bangalore. But I said, that my nephew said, uh, Mama, uh, have you been commenting on the streets in Colombo? I said, yeah, all right. Then I went and found there was a guy who took my name. Uh, and then after months of persuasion, I was able to get him off Twitter and get on Twitter myself. Now, fortunately, this was the pre-Amit Walia, pre-AK-47 era of Twitter. So God knows what people would have been saying. So I think these dangers do exist. But at the same time, you know, I don't think it's entirely one side. Uh, when I quoted Amit Shah to say beware of social media, it's because lots of uh, sensible, non-dogmatic, non-abusive people who want to use social media as a vehicle of information and ideas and argument, civilized argument, relatively civilized argument, are also coming on. So, uh, it would be interesting to see how it unfolds. Uh, you know, the coming no, it's on the other side. Lalu Yadav recently uh, wow. sent a, put out a, a, a retweet, a, a tweet of a RTI reply, which said that uh, no MOU was signed between the Indian and uh, Japanese governments during this whole recent bullet train brouhaha, ah, ah. and that again went viral among the other side of the political spectrum. It was true because uh, one of the fact-checking websites found that the MOU was not signed now, it was signed in 2015. Yeah. So, you know, this has happened on both sides of the, um, of, of, of the this as well. But there is also a lot of good that can be done. And I think one was recently with the Bombay police, um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of governments actually are learning examples from the social media troll uh, and interjecting themselves in public debates and disciplining people as well. The Mumbai police recently, you know this, there's actor Varun Dhawan, I think, I've not seen any of his movie, but I saw this tweet. Varun Dhawan was, uh, uh, had a selfie with a woman who had, uh, was trying to take a selfie. Uh, she, she was in auto rickshaw. His car was next door at a traffic junction. So she leaned out and was many, uh, contorting herself to try to take a photo with him. So he leaned out of his car and they were out there in the car and he said, yeah, I've taken it for you. 
So the Mumbai police saw this and interjected and said, this is fine in the movies, not in real life. Right. The Chalan is on its way. <laughs> so I think the Mumbai police do that. The, Bombay, the Bangalore police also do a very good job of this using humor, etc. So there's a lot of good that can come out. We don't actually know uh, how that is, uh, how that can uh, uh, evolve. What is your personal experience uh, with trolls? I say this because Ram is trolled all the time. This morning I just went to his Twitter handle to see some innocuous uh, comments he has said. And of course there's the general abuse, that trolling that goes on and on. What are your methods for coping? Well, uh, mostly don't look at the timeline. Uh, uh, develop a thick skin. Uh, and, you know, sometimes make fun of them, sometimes make fun at yourself. Uh, you know, for example, uh, just the other day, uh, three or four days ago, uh, I don't watch or appear on Republic TV and Times now. I've stated this publicly, so this is well known. So, so have, uh, a Nepali friend told me, do you know that Arnab Goswami has done a half hour show on you? <laughs> so I said, no, it was about a month ago. About a month ago, I made some comments about the uh, our army chiefs, um, uh, rather uh, promiscuous commentary on all kinds of matters that had no bearing on the military but had a lot of bearing on uh, you know, the current regime. So I wrote a piece and Arnab Goswami did a half hour show attacking me. And uh, uh, which of course, uh, so and a Nepali friend a month later told me, so I mean it's highly amusing, the show is highly amusing. Because it starts by saying there is a chap called Guha. He wants a lot of attention. He wants a lot of it. Anyway, so, and it goes on. So I tweeted, and I said, how do I tweet about that? I, because the tools, I want to have fun with the experts too. I said, a Nepali friend uh, uh, who is a connoisseur of Indian comedy shows <laughs> <laughs> alerted me to one in which I am the star and be absent. You know. All right. Now, I think part of, your, part of the way you just have fun with the experts. Right? And, you know, and I think uh, part of Rahul Gandhi's success and I say Rahul Gandhi's success because the Twitter handle is called Office of Rahul Gandhi. Though as we know, it's highly improbable that he has the wit to write those tweets uh, himself. Right? Now, uh, I think it's very likely, as I said, it's, it's someone from our hometown who's writing that. So Bangalore should claim credit. But he makes fun. Whoever it is, he or she. She in his name. She, she, she is very You can say it. Okay. I can say it. Okay. Okay. I don't know how widely known it is. But so, you know, I, I, that's, a, that's a lovely weapon. That's a lovely weapon to say, you know, have, have, have fun. And so I think uh, uh, humor, uh, self-deprecatory humor are ways of dealing with it. But, you know, I, they can't stand it. You know, they obviously, but I want to say one last thing about, uh, uh, to, uh, to, add, uh, to, to add a further footnote to what you said, uh, Samar, about women getting it badly, like, you know, uh, Priya, for example, or Sakrika Ghosh. Women get it badly, and women with minority names get it worst. You know, I think on Twitter, in our profession, which is writing on India, you know, I think uh, independent-minded women writers and journalists get it badly. Those who have Muslim and Christian names get it worst. And that is really creepy and horrible. I mean, that's of course reflective of the wider society uh, and the way and the polity and how it's changing. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is to me uh, the truly worrying part. Where you can't laugh or joke about it. That it's a hateful culture, there's a hateful army which hates independent minded women and hates women who are not Hindu particularly. Some and this is all legitimized by the ruling party and their <coughs> And this should also should be said. Now, something that is intrinsic to trolling <laughs> is the question of fake news. So let's uh, discuss that a bit. Now, uh, it is uh, obviously the mass creation of news that is just fake, that is just not true. The Chinese government does this rather well. They have, uh, there was a Harvard study recently which found that every year there are 448 million fake messages that are being put out by Chinese government trolls, handles, etc. And they did a, one study of about 43,800 pro-government comments they analyzed and found that 99.3% came from civil servants and government departments. <laughs> yeah. And so they have about 30,000 to 2 million people, part-time, many of them are part-time, whose job is just to do this, to set the agenda. What might now this do uh, to agenda setting in a country uh, like India? How was the agenda set? Take us a bit through taking the history, keeping history in mind. How was the agenda set in the past and how do you see that changing in the age of social media? 
you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting because uh, what you're seeing in China, Sabar, uh, is after a very long time, after Mao, uh, the creation of a personality cult. I mean, Xi Jinping is, uh, though, uh, uh, according to the most recent party congress, he's been equated with Mao and Deng. So now there's officially Xi Jinping thought, like there was Deng Xiaoping thought and Mao. It's actually Mao. I mean, the three, the, uh, the great personality cults of the 20th century were Hitler, Mussolini on the right, and Stalin and Mao on the left. Now, in the 21st century, you're getting a, a, a renewal of personality cult. And people uh, in China, and people talk about India-China rivalry, and we additionally see of the Xi Jinping Modi rivalry, right? In terms of, uh, you know, uh, because what's happening in China is no longer the, the civil servants have to be no longer to be loyal to the regime, but they have to exalt the leader. And in India, also that is happening. You know, it's quite interesting to see if you, you know, uh, when Mr. Narendra Modi took over in 2014, for the first year or two, he was obsessed with his foreign image. Uh, that's no longer the case. Now he's more worried about winning the next election, so he doesn't care about this foreign image. But in those first two years, if you followed, as I did, the NEA official spokesperson, I think someone should do a study of the tweets issued by the Ministry of External Affairs official spokesperson in the first two years. How many times uh, was Narendra Modi mentioned? How many times was Sushma Swaraj mentioned? I suspect it will be a thousand to one. Be the ratio. Maybe 10,000 to 1 also possibly. But in, in the region, right. How many times when uh, a foreign trip was made or a foreign deal was struck, it was all personalized? It was Modi, 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 Modi. I mean, there was uh, one official spokesman who happens to be a novelist in our High Commissioner in Canada. I'm told he's a good novelist. Uh, but he was a very loyal propagandist for the Prime Minister as well, you know. And that is not what uh, uh, spokespeople are supposed to do. I mean, they are supposed to talk about, you can talk the government, you can talk about India's greatness vis-a-vis -vis China or America, but not Narendra Modi's. And I think this is, and it's interesting that there's an India-China rivalry about personality cults. I mean, uh, Trump will fail. Trump wants to create a personality cult around himself, but he's already failed. But I think Xi Jinping and Modi, I think, are two interesting examples of, uh, of 21st century personality cults in which the official machinery, including the official social media machinery, of course the party social media machinery as well, uh, will start personalizing prints. You know, uh, so that's one thing. The other thing I want to say again, to go back to my uh, rather <coughs> naively optimistic uh, uh, thoughts about social media today, is that when it comes to fake news too, someone else you know very well, there's a pushback. I mean, look at a site like Alt News. What fantastic work it is doing, exposing fake news. No, so there is pushback, definitely. But uh, let's take that further. A lot of government policy now is uh, actually unfolding on social media. You mentioned Sushma Swaraj. Yeah. Now, government does not specifically have a policy on how to deal with uh, Pakistanis who come over here. And there's a long waiting list for those who want to come over for medical treatment. But if you tweet directly to Sushma Swaraj, the chances are that she will say, yes, I am issuing a, a, a visa right now. And we say that almost every day. So that's all that's left for her in her job, right? Everything else will be taken away by the PM. Exactly, she can issue visas to uh, uh, gravely ill Pakistanis. We should be grateful at least to Kasaki. But, but, but what are the dangers of government policy now being conducted <coughs> and pressured by fake news and by trolls, etc.? And is, does this not reflect back to the old days of dictatorships, etc., where there were armies on the streets, but now there are the armies on net? You mentioned Xi Jinping and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Modi, um, but there are others as well that do that there in the Philippines. There is Erdogan, of course, in Turkey. All these are democratically elected dictators who have been um, elected. I think uh, uh, in our situation may not be as big because uh, China, Philippines, and Turkey, I think uh, dissent uh, is far weaker than enough. You know, of course, we constantly complain about uh, intolerance and rightly, but there are spaces for dissent in our country because we have a much longer democratic history uh, than uh, the China, the Philippines, or Turkey. And that's why you have a phenomenon like all things, debunking, uh, you know, uh, the fake news. So I think uh, you have, the spaces may vary, you know, Karnataka may be freer than Gujarat, for example, right? Uh, 
uh, uh, broadly in South India, maybe more plural and tolerant than North India. But I don't despair. You know, I often say that, uh, I've said in the past, that, and this is of course linked to what's happening in social media too, the debate today is between Modi and Shah. I mean, the political contest, the political contest today, because as is well known, uh, and I've said it far too often, I don't have a high opinion of Rahul Gandhi. Right. Now, so that, what is the contest today? The contest today is between Modi and Shah on the one side, and the ghosts and the institutional legacies of Ambedkar and Nehru on the other. That's, that's the contest. And that the ghosts and institutional legacies of Nehru and Ambedkar are alive. They're not dead. Right. Uh, no, Rahul Gandhi does not know how to evoke or invoke or take them further. You know? I mean, both Ambedkar and Nehru would have been appalled by the soft Hindutva nature of his Gujarat campaign. Posting about his Janayu and all of that. But those institutional legacies exist. And this festival is an example of this. You know, many. So I think, so that says I don't despair. That 70 years of constitutional democracy, however flawed, have given us certain spaces that are denied, that are sadly denied to the citizens of Turkey, Philippines, let alone China, Vietnam, Cuba, Venezuela, and so on. And I think the pushback you're seeing now on social media is, it, it is an indirect tribute to Ambedkar and Nehru, and people like that. I mean, I'm mentioning Ambedkar and Nehru because in many ways they were the two most important uh, framers of our, our constitution. But uh, in a sense, it's, it's, it's carrying on that legacy in the 21st century. And I think that's, I take heart in that. I take heart in that. I mean, even if, you know, I, you know, all of us are looking for, a, all of us means people of my persuasion, have been looking for political alternatives. So, I, in, because I detest dynastic rule, I stupidly and naively put my faith in Nitish Kumar. I said, should take over the Congress and the next week he joined the BJP instead. And I had egg on my face. Uh, my young, my children, people of my generation thought that Kedriwal would be the hope in the future. And he's turned out to be as much of a megalomaniac as you know, Modi and Mamta is no better, right? But I think we have these institutional spaces that are, that is in my mind the battle today. It's also on social media. It's a, it's a battle between authoritarianism, personality, cult, uh, uh, vindictiveness and vengeance on the one side and open-mindedness, tolerance, pluralism on the other, you know. And uh, maybe we don't have a political vehicle, a proper party political vehicle for constitutional values anymore. But those institutions have been there, those memories are there, you know, and they carry on. And young people don't want to be coerced. And I think in that sense, I do take some. I'm happy that you're optimistic. This is optimistic. I am not as optimistic as you are. But given the fact that you see this kind of hope, there's a problem in what you say. And the problem is that um, the nature of social media and the nature of trolling disallows the emergence of someone that you describe here, open-minded, pluralistic, etc. I can't see any example of someone who has risen or has been created by social media who fits that description. Well, certainly satire and humor that social media has given a new way. I mean, I'm not active on Facebook or Instagram. But on Twitter, uh, you know, there are some wonderful satirical handles, you know, that are doing quite well. And, you know, you know are circulated. They're fun. They're humorous. Uh, and they're taking the mickey about pomp uh, or out of pompous, pretentious, bigoted people in power, right? So I think uh, uh, I mean you may not have in, you know someone with 20 million followers on Twitter who's uh, you know uh, giving you who's passing Ambedkar's thought for you today, right? Okay, but uh, I think if you look at what's happening, and as I said, the fact that uh, you have a kind of pushback. Uh, I think it's hurting. I think beyond the point, we, uh, but Indians have been used to expressing their views. And I think satire is a good example. That fun is being made of powerful people. You know, uh, and you get a laugh out of it. I mean, you could always make fun of Rahul Gandhi and get people to laugh along with you. But you can now make fun of Modi and still get people to laugh out uh, along with you too. Right? So I think satire is a great way to And there's some wonderful satirical handles I find. You know, uh, and sometimes they're incredibly funny. I mean, one guy who's I, who should I mention? He's not, he's not a cult hero, but you probably follow him. He's a chap on India Explained. Yes. Uh, who used to be, who used to of tweet under the handle, Rashdi Explains India. And uh, he is uh, totally over the top. He's sometimes crazy, sometimes he's very funny. So, yesterday, for example, I loved the tweet of his. Uh, what had happened was uh, now, because of the fact that the economy is not doing so well, and as Ganesh Devi reminded us yesterday, 
Achhe din in Hindi means something very different from Achhe din in Gujarati. There is a fall back to the Ram Tamil movie campaign. That's going to come up front. It's all something all of us should worry about. And yesterday there was a news item where Vinay Katiyar, the hardliner of the 1990s, said, "If memory serves, Jama Masjid was Jamna Devi Temple, and Taj Mahal was Tejo Tejo Mahal. Right? And 6,000 sites have been reclaimed." And India, India Express tweeted that with a comment saying, "And Saint Stephen's, which is my college, by the way, Saint Stephen's was Sant Sita Fal Mandir." Yes, of course. Jamuna Devi and Saint Stephen was Sant Sita. But look at the imagination. So, so this guy is very funny. He has been over here this time. Some of this one. Yeah, yeah. So I think. This kind of satire, you know, passy, passy democracy, all of the above. I mean, so I think something is happening which we should take heart. 